Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Um, joining us on the Advanced Techniques Ethos webinar. I'm joined with Dr. Dominic O'Hooley and Dr. Peter Fairburn. Um, Dr. Dominic O'Hooley is going to be speaking first, uh, showing you some a few different advanced techniques and advanced cases. Uh, he's a very experienced Ethos user and uh, been using it for a long time and can certainly teach us all a, a few things. So I'm going to pass you straight on to, to Dominic. Um, Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you so much for coming and joining us for this uh, webinar, Ethos, Ethos Advanced Techniques. And I'm gonna go straight into the first case. Um, the first case today really is showing the use of Ethos for, a, for an apisectomy on two upper central incisor teeth. And I've used it for an unusual reason. What I've done here is I've decided that both teeth were, I'm afraid, unrestorable. Uh, Post-crowned uh, teeth that where they had root fractures. However, one of the teeth, the upper left central, had a large cyst. And I decided what I was going to do was I was going to actually use ethos to repair the cyst cavity after a nucleation. And uh, then I was going to wait for ethos to be converted to true host bone. And then I was going to place inverter, southern inverter implants with immediate loading. So it's quite an interesting case. Um, this was the preoperative situation. Uh, you can see an implant I placed nine years before at the upper right lateral. The upper right central, uh, a small apical area, but the upper left one, a very large uh, apical area that was actually cystic. And as you can see, what I've done here is I've done a, a modified rhomboidal flap, um, leaving the papillae in place. The patient's a female patient in her early 50s with a high lip line. And so it's very important here to try and keep the papilla stable during this. The two central crowns, we can see there, what I've done is I've remo removed the cortical plate uh, and I've removed the cyst from the upper left one. Uh, the upper right one, I've done a smaller access removed the tip of the root and uh, 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 placed uh, MTA on the tip of the root as I have on the upper left one as well to seal the root tip from my ethos build. And here we can now see that I've placed the ethos. Uh, the ethos is, um, has been placed into both of the, uh, into both of the bony cavities. And then I've placed a second tranche of ethos, uh, a medium mix just over the surface as well, but keeping it flat. There was no way here I wanted to build outside the bony envelope to create some form of excessive bulk. Um, what you will notice is that I had placed ethos, uh, the ethos precursor, something called Fortos Vital, which is another beta tricalcium phosphate material at the upper right too many years before, you can see here. And what's really interesting is the beautiful cortical plate that we've got there. This is a week after the surgery is completed. There's a combination of proline sutures and some PTFE sutures. You'll notice that there's biofilm on the, on the surface. The patient was very good. She didn't brush vigorously over this area. And as we can see, we've got stable papillae there and healing's very good for a week. You often find this with ethos um, because it's a bacteriostatic material. I tend to find that I get really good healing. And secondly, I'm, I'm interested to see what happens with the epithelium over time. So this is at 10 weeks. And we can see that if you look carefully, you can see the scar in there, but it's not particularly apparent. It seems to be quite um, in line with the epithelial junction between the keratinized and the uh, non carotenized and we can see there the upper right two crown on the implant that I placed many years before with uh, the beta tricalcium phosphate giving us that beautiful bony contour and then on the centrals we can see that the two crowns are in place there uh, with the ethos above and here we can see a CT scan uh, sectional CT showing the apisectomized root tip 
of the upper left central incisor, shown as the ethos above it, which has now been converted to bone. However, it does retain the appearance, so the macro appearance of ethos granules. So you, you have that kind of, in the shorter term, though it's bone, and we've got um, uh, Trefine studies to show that, though it's bone, what's interesting here is that you do get that slightly different form there. So rather than a trabecular form of mature host bone, you're still at an earlier stage there. Over the years, you'll notice it will change to that. So what I'm doing here is I'm placing uh, crowns at both teeth. Um, I'm gonna be placing implants. These are Southern inverter implants, a very novel implant design with a narrow coronal portion. Uh, and then a, a wider middle section that allows me to get very high stability. What I've done is I've made lab made provisional crowns that have been made by my colleague Phil Reddington upstairs and I've prepared them at chair side to fit over two peak cylinders. This is a material called peak and what it does is it allows me a little bit of wiggle room so that I've got room to put flowable composite down to pick these up but secondly, I've got a little bit of room to just make sure that they're absolutely in the correct position when I place them. And now we can see I'm taking the, taking the teeth out. I use a sterile protocol and the patient is draped. We're taking the teeth out as atraumatically as I can. And now I'm placing the inverter implant. You'll notice it's on a carrier here. It's a coaxis implant, which means the connection between the implant and the screw channel is 12 degrees offset. And therefore, when it's placed, we have to place it carefully at the right angle, buccolabially, uh, sorry, labiopalatally, to allow for the screw channel of the eventual crown to be in the correct palatal location. And here we see ideal positioning. The carrier now has got its marker on the outside showing the, the correct rotational position. And the actual, the angulation of the carrier is correct, both bucco mesially and also, sorry, uh, mesodistally, but also labiopalatally. So it's the correct 3D position. And now I've placed two implants. So we've got the implants in place. We can see that we've got a circumferential jump gap, but it's slightly more prominent towards the labial. We've got two healing abutments on there and I've put them on just to allow me to place ethos as a jump gap augmentation material. And then I've placed the ethos here and I've taken off the, once it's set, I've taken off the two helium abutments and I've replaced it with my two peak cylinders. And you can see we've got a good position from those now. And now we see I've placed the crowns. Uh, this is a week afterwards and we can see the initial healing from the site. So the crowns are uh, provisional crowns. You can see that we've got a little, still, still a little bit of healing going on on the gingiva there but it's doing very well. It's doing very well indeed at a week. What I've got to be very aware of here is that these crowns have got to be out of the occlusion. It doesn't matter what implant you place and, then, and at what insertion torque. And with inverters, I'm often placing at 70 to 80 Newton centimeters insertion torque. We still want the crowns to be out of occlusion. And you've got to have a good patient who understands they can't be biting on these teeth for the first few weeks because we've got the implant stability dip and we don't want that to be an issue. And there you can see the uh, implants are being placed next to the older implant there. You can see that I've managed to avoid the incisive foramen. You can see that we've engaged the birth and host bone, and we've also engaged the bone host bone that's come from the ethos build that we did previously. We've got high torque on both sides. On the left side, I've used a slightly longer implant than I've used on the right, a 15 on the left and a 13 on the right. Both implants had achieved in excess of 70 Newton centimeters. And you can see the healing abutments in place on this, on this radiograph. And here on the radiograph, you see that we've now got the temporary crowns in, and this is four months after I placed the implants and loaded with the temporary crowns. And what, what you find with the peak abutments is you don't see them very clearly when you look on the radiograph. But what you do see here is this beautiful burn that's coming around the corners of the top of these implants. Very pleasing to see. And this is 16 weeks post-placement. 
So we're starting to think about taking an impression. And if you look at the lovely gingival contours there, no difference whatsoever from when I actually removed the teeth. Um, we use the open tray technique for this. And here are the crowns about five minutes after I fitted them. So she's now got zirconia crowns. These are screw retained. And we can see that the gingival contours are the same as before. There's been no change, no change in buckle ridge contour either. You can just faintly see that scar from that initial apisectomy. But to be honest with you, it's pretty hard to see. Very pleasing result um, and looks even better after six weeks when these have been in place. What you'll, you'll tend to find is that a, a, year, review, a year review, you'll it'll look even better again. And we often see this slight upregulation of the gingiva that come with ethos usage. It's a fantastic, almost a side effect. It's very interesting to see. So that's the day of fit of the final crowns. And you can see the beautiful, uh, we've got the beautiful fit there. We've got the um, platform shift. We've got the burn around the corner and we've got nicely contoured crowns, uh, abutments. Um, and I'm very pleased with that. Okay, so we're going to move straight on now to case two. Uh, case two today is a case that's really fairly interesting to me. This is a case that, um, well, to be honest with you, it's, uh, it's, it's totally different. This is why where I'm using ethos, not for implants whatsoever. What I'm doing here is I'm, I'm, I've got a patient who's got a combination of external resorption and caries affecting an unerupted, horizontally impacted lower left third molar. Now this is really complicated because not only is the tooth horizontally impacted with these uh, crown issues, so it's got external resorption, it's also got caries. But in addition to that, we've got, it's become non-vital. And in addition to that, it's in very close proximity to the ID canal. So the nerve is absolutely laying right on this tooth. So for very many reasons, I want to try and preserve the second molar. I want to try and get bone back between the second molar and the site of the third molar removal. And so my choice here was to use ethos as an immediate repair material after very careful removal of this tooth. This tooth, I couldn't have left the roots in place and done decoronation because of the fact that it was going non-vital as well. So it's quite a difficult one. And here you see the initial radio, uh, CT scan. And you can see the uh, ID canal directly beneath the tooth. You can see a crypt at the front of the tooth. But on this slice of the image, you don't see the uh, caries and the other issues with the third molar. You can see if you look very carefully that the cortical plate of the ID canal is in place and the ID canal doesn't appear to be deviated or it doesn't also appear to be narrowed. And that suggests that the tooth is truly laying above it. And here's a radiograph. And what the radiograph shows me is, is the external resorption. And also what I think is caries that's come down from the crypt. I think chronic plaque retention between the back of that second molar and the third molar, we've got caries there. And I think you'd agree this is a difficult and complex case uh, with a fairly high risk of damage to the ID nerve. What I find very interesting, if I look very carefully at this radiograph, is there is a bony trabecular at the distal of the second molar. And if you look really carefully, it comes fairly high up. And that's interesting to me and that's, that's very important. And that adds to my feeling that I can achieve really, really good burn if, if infill here. So a clinical photograph now it shows me that I've done a flap. Uh, what I'm doing here is I'm actually removed some buccal bone, but not very much. And what I've tried to do is very carefully section the, the third molar, removing the crown from the roots. And what I've tried to do, and it's really important here is I've used a very careful sectioning technique, leaving the apical portion in place rather than cutting right through. The last thing I want to do is actually iatrogenically damage the nerve by inappropriate use of a handpiece in that position. Um, here you see the crown has now been removed. The final removal was done by putting a flat plastic into there and turning it just to click 
and break the crown off very gently and then remove it very gently indeed. And here the roots are out. So we've got the roots out. You can see the two roots have come out nicely. On the uh, left side, you can see a very small pile on the end of that root and it's all come out in place. Very, very careful probing of the socket, super careful to just see if there was any granulation tissue at the tip. And then an ethos build. So here what we've done is I've placed ethos uh, in several tranches into the burner cavity. This has involved ethos a medium mix. I've neither placed it very dry or really wet. What I've done is I've placed a medium mix and it's ended up being over two cc's of ethos. So it's a lot of ethos here. And now you can see that I've closed the site tension free using PTFE 5.0 sutures. These are interrupted. Uh, the patient had no reduction or alteration in sensation whatsoever. He had a little bit of trismus and you'd expect that after a treatment like this. And here you can see the radiograph, which I think very clearly illustrates that I've been able to place ethos very, very nicely there above the ID canal. And in addition, up against the uh, second molar. And that's at two weeks post-placement. Okay, so here we go to case three this morning. Case three is um, a case that's very close to my heart and you'll find out why as we go through it, okay? Uh, this is an example of a few techniques all at the same time. The first technique is that I'm gonna evaluate the patient. I'm going to understand that this is an appropriate candidate for an advanced treatment protocol. This patient has got a traumatized upper incisor. Unfortunately, it was traumatized a year before. He had a crown fracture and the tooth was root treated in the crown. The actual patient's tooth crown was stuck back on. It's unfortunately failing. And unfortunately for him, he's losing bone on the palatal down to the level of the palatal fracture. So these are these tooth fractures you often see with an impact against the face where you've got a fishtail fracture with the fracture being at roughly gingival level on the labial, but on the palatal, it tracks down underneath the level of the palatal gingiva. What I decided to do here was use a Southern inverter implant again with the lab made provisional crown and an ethos build across the circumferential jump gap around the implant and then definitive crown and one year CT scan to show the uh, ridge contour at that time. And here we see the preoperative situation, a, a, a chap with very minimal rest restored mouth. In fact, he's got no fillings. He's a student at Liverpool, um, where I used to go, uh, studying chemistry. And this chap has got the, uh, his upper left central incisor has been stuck back on rather poorly. This is the second time it was stuck back on. And it's rather unesthetic. He's got a central diastema, um, but his gingival contour is very nice. He's got full papilla there uh, with no loss of the papilla. And it doesn't appear that he's got any infective sequelae happening on the label here. So looking at a CT sectional image prior to treatment, if you look very carefully, it has got a labial plate here. When you get down to the apical third of the root, you'll notice that there's some erosion of the apical, apical plate. However, it hasn't come through to the labial. So you've got an actual void between the root and the, uh, and the labial outer cortical surface. If you look very carefully at this, you will be able to see the, the fra fracture line. So you can see the fracture line tracking from the sort of just above the mid third of the, of the, of the labial, tracking through the tooth and coming out much higher up on the palate and much to, more towards the apical. And if you look very carefully, we've lost apical, we've lost um, palatal bone here already. It's, it's not looking as healthy as it could be in this position here. So the tooth comes out. Again, I use a sterile protocol. I try my very best to be as atraumatic as possible taking the tooth out. But what you can notice on this is you can notice that not only has the patient got a pile on the end of the tooth, the periapical radiolucency, a granuloma, but you can see that there's an area of granulation tissue tracking up the root as well. I was quite interested that the bonding of the crown remained in place and it came out in one piece. And here you see now that we've got a cavity. Uh, we, unfortunately, despite my very best efforts, there was some trauma to the gingiva on removal of the tooth. 
And here we see the inverter implant again. This inverter is a very novel implant design, quite a, an active portion here, tapered with quite a fat midsection. And then this very, very narrower uh, coronal portion. We've also got the um, coaxis with a 12 degree screw channel ang angulation on this particular implant. And there the implant has been placed into the ideal location to allow me to uh, place the screw channel in the right place. And what's interesting is I've been able to go right down the middle of the ridge. So because we've got coaxis here, I haven't had to place my implant with a straight screw connection towards the platel, ending up with a really big buckle uh, overhang or a, a, a buckle ledge on my definitive crown. Having the implant down the center of the ridge allows me to have a beautiful emergence profile of my uh, both my provisional crown and also of my definitive crown. And my own personal view is this supports the papilla and this also allows longer term predictable stability for this implant in this very young patient who's in his early 20s. Now we see the peak abutment in place. The peak abutment has been placed showing where the screw will emerge and you can see it's going to come through the mid third or the cingulum of the central incisor. Absolutely spot on. And here we see the ethos build. Uh, ethos again, a me medium mix. I never, I don't like a really wet mix. I tend to use a medium mix here and then use sterile cotton pledges, cotton gauze to actually dampen and tampen down on the, on the ethos to remove liquid and moisture to a degree. I do like seeing this blood within the ethos. I think that's very useful. I don't like seeing an ethos plug that's pure white with absolutely no vascular ingress whatsoever, no blood ingress. I don't want to see that. And here we can see the provisional crown has been picked up, flowable composite inside it. And we can see very clearly here that we have a nice gum contour. We have a nice uh, emergence profile, sorry, that will allow a good gum, gum contour. And here it is, immediately placed. And, you know, I've got to be honest with myself. Okay, yes, this patient's close to my heart, and yet I still managed to traumatise his gum. You know, and this is what happens in life. So, yes, there's some trauma here. Um, and there's a little space, and you can see some ethos. And you may be wondering, well, gosh, he's left ethos exposed. Don't worry about it. Small amount of ethos exposure. It's a bacteriostatic material. You'll get fast epithelialization over that and you'll get a really, really predictable gingival infill happening here. The crown itself has to be out of his occlusion again. Uh, and unfortunately, it just has a slightly triangular shape. So aesthetically, it's a little bit unpleasing. He was quite happy with it. If you look very carefully at the... Uh, at the um, between the two centrals, you'll notice there's a slight cant as well of about five degrees off from the uh, left side to the right. Uh, it's difficult. It's a more aesthetically challenging case than it looks this one. So here we go, so four months. And what did I tell you? So look, if you look at the gingival contour, if we go back a slide and just look at where it is there and look at where it is there. So we've got lost absolutely no papilla height whatsoever, particularly this really, really important distal papilla. You'll often see with an immediate placement of a central incisor that the distal papilla is very vulnerable to loss and it hasn't gone at all. It's only early days, it's only four months, but here we go. And you can see this, if anything, I've got upregulation of the gingiva and I've also got this beautiful, almost hyper gingival form here. I've got too much gingiva and that's great. I'd rather have too much than too little. Oh, look at that. So here we are at about seven months now, and we've got these gorgeous tissues, and we've got completely an utter stability of the ridge form. We've lost no book, we've lost no ridge width whatsoever. You can see that the implants in place with a beautiful collar there. You can see that we've got this screw channel come, going to be coming out in the right position. So we take an impression. This is after after I placed the impression coping. Once I've placed the impression coping, I then tend to modify it with flowable composite. I want to pick up the shape of that lovely collar that I've created. But again, this is a beautiful slide that shows you this incredible ridge width that we've got, this absolute preservation of the ridge contour that you see with the judicious use of ethos in this situation, together 
with this inverter implant, allowing endosteal burn and ridge stability. How many cases would you see with a traditional implant where you're already losing bone, bone width there? And I'd put it to you that you'd see a lot. An impression using FlexiTime. FlexiTime is an amazing material. It's a really good material. It's a little bit like Impregum in a lot of ways, but it's uh, in some ways better because the flow bulb, the light body com com uh, com area of it is in a different color, allows you to see your impression. If you look carefully at this, you can see where the uh, screw channel is coming out and you can also see my composite modification showing the pickup of the collar. So happy with that. So, and here we see, I'm not doing a screw, I'm not doing a cement retained crown here. I want you to be very sure of this. What I'm doing here is I'm trying my screw retained abutment prior to the lab fixing the crown, the zirconia crown to the abutment. So what I'm doing is I'm looking at the abutment shape and contour. I'm looking at how much space I've got around it. I'm looking at where it goes into the and fit its appropriate fit. And it also gives me the opportunity to do a sexy photograph like that. But again, look at the papilla. So we see the crown now being made in the laboratory. Sylvie is the technician upstairs with Phil Radington. So Sylvie was the girl who, what amazing uh, results she did of this. It's a beautiful crown, such care and attention to detail. And here you can see the screw channel, the use of the inverter implant with coaxis, this amazing concept that Southern developed. One of my colleagues, Greg Boys Varley, uh, and Dale Hoy's two guys who, who developed this amazing, amazing technique to have the screw channel offset at an angle. And so you can place your implant just where you want it, but still have screw retained with the screw channel in the right place. And, uh, you know, I'm happy with that. <laughs> look at that. Wowzers. Now, look very carefully. We've still got a little cant there. We've still got a slight, it's not quite vertical. Yeah, you could perhaps say perhaps a tiny, 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 tiny little bit too much fluorosis and a little tiny bit too much uh, opalescence just at the neck there. But to be honest with you, wow, that's such a great result. And we can see on the day of placement here, the cross-sectional CT scan, and it shows me very clearly the ethos build. The ethos is going into the original tooth position. And you can see how I've placed the implant into the absolutely perfect mid ridge position with the coaxis implant uh, connection coming out in the, in the correct location for screw retained. And here we can see a year later that the crown's been in place now for a few months. And here you can see this absolutely gorgeous preserved ridge. Absolutely gorgeous. And what's really, really exciting here is would you look at the fillet? So by doing a circumferential jump gap fill with ethos here, I've gained palatal bone. And if we remember going back to the beginning of this case, this patient had lost some palatal bone. It was looking a bit ragged because that was where the fracture line finished, but it's coming back. It's coming back. So from the front there, a periapical radiograph showing fantastic bone, showing the platform switch connection there and the beautiful fit of the crown showing the fact that we're able to miss the incisive foramen and yet we've got this beautiful inter uh, distance between the implant and the tooth next door. Preservation of this gorgeous uh, um, burn peak and, that, and the thus preservation of the papillae. And this is why it's so important. <laughs> this is Gabriel, my, my son, my oldest boy. That's me looking a bit ugly as usual, but that's my son. Um, so happy with his beautiful new crown. This is Laura, who's my superb dental implant nurse at adult dental practice. She's amazing. And uh, I think you can even see with a, with a mask on how pleased she is that, that this has gone so well. Okay, so now we're going to move to case four this morning. Um, Case four is a, I've sort of upped the challenge a little bit here for you. I hope you found this an exciting one. This is the use of the inverter implant with ethos build for a, a lower incisor. And uh, this is the first one that's been done in the world. The first lower incisor that's been done using the Southern inverter implant. 
And I'll be honest with you, this can be done because the patient had historically lost an incisor and had the space closed and had a rather unhealthy looking situation with a, a little bit more bone width than I would have had if he'd had four lower incisors. So I think that allowed me to have the space for the inverter. So there's a bit of cheating going on here on my part. But at the same time, this shows ethos used in an incredibly big, but very, very carefully placed buckle build. So here we see the preoperative situation and you can see that there is three incisors here. One of the incisors is at an angle. It's been apisectomized very poorly with amalgam. It's got a purse crown and it's got an unfortunately a rather failed uh, re-endo attempt where the root filling material is extruded past the um, apisectomy and curled itself around the tip of the root. We've got uh, a small granuloma at the end of the root as well. But one thing that we do know is that we've got some fairly nice bone there. We've lost the uh, uh, bone peak between these incisors. And I want you to remember that. We've lost the bone peak. Please remember that. So this is the preoperative situation and, I, and oh, it doesn't look too bad. This is looking down at it. We can see we've got his canines here. We've got three incisors. We've got a scar here, look carefully. We've got a scar on the keratinized gingiva where the fourth where, where the fourth incisor was, was lost. We can see that this is a crown. It's been, somebody's finessed it with a bit of composite down here. It obviously had some recession, but generally he's got fairly good papilla for saying that he's got a loss of burn peaks underneath the surface. And here is the CT scan cross-sectional view. And this is at the level of the apisectomy. So it's showing across the amalgam restoration, showing the apisectomy, the amalgam there. And it's showing that we really have got very, very, very little buckle plate here at all. We've also got the scar present, which you can see is not only keratinized gingiva, but it's tied down onto the bone. And it's led me to have a bony defect towards the side of where the tooth is as well. So we take the tooth out in pieces. It was fractured and a piece came out. And you can see if you look very carefully here, this is interesting. This is the apisectomy. So this is the amalgam restoration. It's got a curiously dappled appearance, but this is this is amalgam here. And unfortunately, the bit of uh, GP has come off and I haven't got it on this photograph, but it was coming out here. So it's quite interesting to see that. Now, what's important? We've got a, an intact socket. However, my gut feeling when I was feeling the buckle of this socket was that the bone was paper thin. The bone was rice paper thin, really thin. And that's important. We also noticed that the scar is still in place, this deep tied down scar onto the bone. And so I'm gonna use the ethos degranulation burrs. I'm gonna use them with plenty of sterile saline irrigation and I'm gonna remove granulation tissue. I need my socket to be perfectly clean. But let's be honest, start degranulating and this bone is coming off labially. So this bone is too thin. To be honest with you, this type of bone is, is it's just dead layer of, of, of rubbish bone and I want it gone. So I removed it. Create quite a large flap here as well. And I did this for several reasons. I did this because I wanted to see where this tie down is. So here we've got the tied down keratinized gingiva. And also we've got the, um, we've got the, where the implant was going to be placed here. And here we can see the implant has been placed into the correct 3D location. So we've got the inverter with coaxis again, and we're placed within the bony envelope. And here we see the large ethos build now. I've carefully sculpted this ethos. This is nearly, it's, it's, it's over one cc of ethos that's been used here. It's been used into the large dehiscence across the top of the implant, but also it's been placed across the ridge to a degree as well. But I haven't overbuilt it. It's very important. Don't overbuild your ethos. And this is the crown nine months later. Wow. <laughs> so we've, we've placed the crown, we've placed the temporary screw retained crown. The patient was in lockdown. The patient was shielding because his wife was unwell. So he didn't come back to see me after the day, after he removed his sutures, he didn't come back to see me for nine months. And here he did on the day of 
coming back to semen. So we've left this totally alone. <laughs> we've left this totally alone. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so look at that. Look at this. Just look at this beautiful, beautiful keratinized gingiva. Look at this complete retention of bony contour. Look at this temporary crown that's just sitting there so natural within the within the occlusal scheme. And look at this gorgeous tissue contour. So look, his scar's gone. We've got no real depression in the gingiva anymore. We've got this amazing retention. We've actually created a lovely, lovely uh, ridge form here. And we've got this gorgeous gum color. And just look at that. So just look at his beautiful papilla. If you look very carefully, you can see some still got some scarring from where we did the, uh, where we did the flap, if you look really carefully. But you're gonna have to look really carefully to see it. And we're gonna do impressions on this now and make his definitive crown. So that's the wonder of ethos and inverter. So you can see that gorgeous temporary crown at nine months with his beautiful ethos converted to her host bone. And we can start to see some uh, bony peaks come in there. So thank you very much indeed. I'm so grateful to you all for listening to me this morning. Um, um, and I hope you found my cases interesting and I hope they raised some thoughts in your mind. So thank you very much. And I'll pass you back to Joe now before we move on to Dr. Uh, Peter Fairburn. Thank you. Thank you there, Dominic. Um, that's some great cases there. If anyone does have any questions, uh, feel free to ask them in the Q&A box. Um, and we're just going to move on to Peter. Hi, uh, thanks. Thanks, Tom. Uh, it's always great to see. I, I love that lower molar because, you know, I mean, that lower uh, incisor because lower cases are really are such a challenge. And it's just incredible how well that's healed. Um, it's been, uh, I mean, it's always exciting to sort of see things. Pete, we before you start. <laughs> Pete, before yeah. you start, I've got, I've got one, uh, one quick question um, from Khalid. Uh, he says they did not see any novel membrane covering the bone graft material. No membrane required. I'm just typing a, an answer here to him, actually, uh, Khalid. Really, what you've what you got to remember here is ethos, um, the calcium sulfate binder within ethos forms a pseudomembrane. Um, and though you don't need, in fact, it's a bad idea to place a collagen membrane. What you want to do is allow the ethos to be in contact with the vascular supply of the periosteum to allow that vascular ingress and to allow over the period of weeks and months for it to be converted to true host bone. So this is really important. Don't put a membrane over your ethos. You don't need to do that. The ethos itself forms a pseudomembrane. I hope that answers your question, Khalid. Yeah, uh, Dom, I, I went through that all at the first lecture, the more introductory lecture. So um, I, yeah. I think, but, but as you know, I get asked this question literally every, uh, you know, every every time I speak, every time I show a case. Uh, and, and, and this is the whole idea. And I explained about the fact that collagen membranes actually impede healing yes. uh, and don't uh, help healing. So we prefer to use the periosteum. Um, there are other questions, but let me go through. Um, I've just got a few more more complex cases, and then we could probably do the questions at the end. Is that I think is not a bad idea. Um, so let me let me just move on with that. Firstly, I'd I'd like to obviously thank thank Dom, and that, that was fantastic. And it's always great to see your work with Inverter. I just did another one yesterday. So I've been using Inverter myself in, in a number of cases and, and been getting great results. Um, first of all, I'd, I'd like to thank all our uh, distributors in the Middle East and in, and in Saudi. And, um, uh, you know, and thanks for the opportunity to get the message across and get the idea across of uh, actually not using animal products or not using human products and actually um, getting better results. That, that's the thing that 
compressed me materials uh, using these materials rather than uh, any uh, ethical points, so to say. Um, anyway, so thanks to the sponsors. So what I'm going to go about is a couple more complex cases. And, and this is using the Servico system, which I've been using more and more of recently. And it's just a system whereby it can help uh, with the emergence profile. In this particular case, it was referred to me uh, three weeks post the extraction uh, and to sort of place the implant. And as you can see, we've already got some sort of uh, some soft tissue loss, hard tissue loss underneath. And by using this system, it allows us to manage the uh, soft tissue emergence profile, but it also holds the gum up. And in that way, it allows us to help build the bone underneath. So when we've raised a flap, you can see here, I've made a slightly bigger um, incision site, bigger flap site than I normally would, but it's just to um, try and actually regenerate a little bit around these areas here where we found that we can improve uh, on these dehiscences and on these defects, we can improve the bone. But you see, we've got a, a reasonable bony defect and a bit of loss of height, uh, you know, a few millimeters. But once I've actually degranulated the site, and you can see now, it's important to actually clean the sites of all the granulation tissue and get back to healthy bone using these techniques. Um, and this is something I mentioned a lot in the earlier stages. So as you can see, we've cleaned the site, cleaned the palatal root, the buccal roots, the, the defect, and then I'm going to place the implant into the trifurcation. And you can see this is in with the bit of bone between the mesiobuccal, distobuccal, and palatal roots. And everything does look um, fine. And here I've done the osteotomy. Yes, you, you could probably use a versa to uh, densify the bone a little bit. I, I feel in this particular case, uh, it's not necessary. We're going to be helping the host regenerate all the bone around in this area as well. So I've just placed the implant. I've placed the any ridge. I think this was a, a five by 8.5 or 5.5 by 8.5. And you can see we can place it now to the correct height. Now, what we're measuring here is we're measuring uh, four millimeters from the implant to the soft tissue zenith. And it does look as though the implant's placed too high for this particular type of implant. But this implant is in fact one to two millimeters subcrestally, which is the exact position to place it. It's just that once we've regenerated the bone, uh, we will notice this, um, this correct position. And then I use this, uh, this Cervico system to modify and make a temporary using composites and to get the uh, perfect emergence profile for this particular tooth, which you select. I mean, it's a whole lecture talking about that. Um, and as you can see here, the 8.5, this is actually a 5.5, I think, looking at the width of it. So this then allows me to then have a trial fit. And when I've actually placed on, you can see how we're going to optimize the emergence profile. Yes, there's a slight palatal defect as well, which needs grafting. So you can see I've grafted the palatal root first here, and now I've got a dryer mix, and I'm going to graft the buccal root, as well as take a little bit here onto the adjacent tooth and onto the bone loss interproximally, because we need this to help restore uh, the papillary long term. So that's what it uh, it looks like. Then I've just put a little bit even of a dry mix over the top, and then we suture closed using PTFE. You can see here, I've used blue M gel over, over the top. Again, this is just an oxygenation gel. It's only for, a, you know, for five, 10 minutes just to help the initial healing. And it just helps protect the site uh, for the first uh, couple of hours, I guess. Um, a few days later, I think this was five days later, you can actually see we've still got the, the scos uh, where we made the incision. But the interesting thing is to see where the papillae are, this healing by secondary intention. And again, you can see how the emergence profile is holding this buckled soft tissue out. And this helps allow the, uh, so the hard tissue to regenerate underneath. And here it is, uh, the patient came in because there was this little bone chip that was coming out on the, on the palatal aspect. And so I got them in after, after a month just to remove it, just so I could take that bone chip out and promote the healing. 
blue M gel again. Whenever we're taking off temporaries and putting them back on again, especially when the bone is, is new and it hasn't matured, it can be very prone to infection. And every time you're taking off temporaries or taking off abutments, you've got to remember that you could be introducing bacteria in there. This is why I like the idea of Costa in, in Dubai at uh, same day about one time, one fit. Um, so it's, it's important to always make sure that we uh, make, you know, keep that site clean and use blue and gel. Anyway, here it is before and here it is at 10 weeks and we're now ready to load. Yes, I know the dentistry next door is not ideal. This is a referral. He's a very old patient and he's not my case. So I, I can't really start suggesting that I'm going to do a whole lot of new crowns on him. So if we have a look here, what we've managed to keep is this buckle height and buckle width. And this is important to keep, by keeping the hard tissue. This is at um, 10 weeks, 11 weeks at, at restoration. And here is the case re restored with a screw retained crown. And you can see again, we've got nice hard and soft tissue uh, maintenance. When we look at the x-ray, again, you can see how the host bone has now regenerated over the top. This is at three months post loading. So you can see that the, the end result is that the implant, which we could see the few threads before, is now actually two millimeters subcrestally, one to two millimeters, as is the ideal position for this any ridge implant. Again, looking at a very similar case by Minas, and it just shows you the potential of of these by allowing uh, and promoting both the soft and hard tissue healing at the same time. And um, if we look at, at this particular case, this is another Southern inverter implant um, without the coaxis. You can see how the soft tissues were collapsing in already. And by merely placing ethos into the site, you can see here and placing a customized temporary made by uh, using a cervical system or any other way you want to do it. And within three months, you see the situation we have when this case was then sent back to the referring dentist. You can see how by just using these modified um, temporaries, which we've uh, made on a custom basis, we can end up by having an improved hard tissue, we get an improved soft tissue. Have a look here. Can you see the lack of keratinized tissue, let alone attached keratinized tissue in the site? And now what we have three months later, and we've done nothing. We've done no soft tissue grafting. We've, uh, we've put the pain through, patient through no extra pain. This is merely a, 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 an aspect of host healing. So it's gone from here to here by just letting the host do the healing for us. And this is the whole big idea about the concept of, of ethos is letting the host do more of the healing and us do less. So we're allowing the host to um, heal without impeding it by putting membranes or foreign materials or material from another animal or another human. Um, the body doesn't necessarily want these. The body just wants to heal and we just need to encourage it. And this is the whole concept of ethos. So, you know, soccer craft, this is by Johnny Cochran. Okay. And again, this just shows this potential to heal and the desire of the body to heal. The body wants to actually heal. This was a, a philosophy I had many years ago. 2008 was the first time I had a lecture with the title, The Body Wants to Heal. Let's work with it. And this is the important thing is understanding that healing will occur despite what we do. So it's really important that uh, we, we actually um, improve this healing and we let the body do it because the body is doing 95% of the work. We're only doing 5% of the work. So you can see where these roots were extracted. Uh, there was another root here. This was a, a, a part of, a, I think, a failing bridge. So when we actually just place the ethos into the site. This is a medium mix again. I think this was only one cc. I generally only use, oh, um, you know, if one cc is, is, is more than enough for a site like this. And then what Johnny does is he sutures with multiple vicral sutures 
to get closure. Um, it's just a technique he uses all the time and he has a lot of success. If you want to, you can see his webinar on uh, Ethop Dental. It's taped on there and you can see a whole lot of his cases. Um, and then 10 weeks later, he opens and here's the, the new host healed ridge. How come have we got such good bone quality? And I know the quality is good because I've taken a lot of core samples and we get over 50% new bone at 10 weeks and only eight to 12% residual graft material. So I know that this is good quality bone because of science, not because of the way it looks. I don't care the way it looks, but you can see that it actually is a nice ridge that's uh, been retained from those previous extraction sites. And this is at 10 weeks. He's then placed two implants and just fit, fitted the healing caps uh, on at the time. And, and the case is now well loaded. So, you know, I won't go further into that. If you want to look at that full case, just go on to Johnny Cochran's uh, case study. So what other areas are we using? And that's what I'm going to be talking about today as well is, yes, uh, you know, we seem to be using it in many, many different areas from, uh, you know, uh, big uh, cysts to apisectomies. Now, this was a, a really good friend of mine, and we could put the perio probe completely down Buckley into this huge area, but the tooth was grade three mobile, but he wanted us to try and keep it. So what we did was an apisectomy with MTA on the root. Yes, one year, it looks like there's still an infection there, but three years later, and he hasn't had a moment's uh, um, pain with the tooth. And here it is. And initially we could put the perio probe the whole way down. Now we've got two, three millimeters. So we've clearly got a new buccal plate that is regenerated. The tooth's completely stable and it has now been there for five years. Since uh, both Manas and myself in the last six years have been using ethos in apisectomies, our success rate uh, has gone to the point that we haven't had a single failure um, in, in six years, doing, you know, doing one, an apisectomy every two or every three weeks. And uh, before both of us, we were saying that our success rate was much lower um, probably in the 60% in the, in the area. So we feel that although endodontists say we don't need to graft the site, we feel there's great benefits in grafting the site with these osteoinductive uh, materials. Perio, I'm doing a lot more perio at the moment. I've just posted uh, some more cases up on uh, Ethos case studies. This is another thing to look at the Facebook site, just come and join us there. And, uh, you know, this is one of the cases that got me more in involved in, and this is Dr. Roman in uh, Malaysia. And uh, this was before, and as you can see, you know, just in nine months later, and you can see, we know that all the graft material is probably gone by now. When you look at it and it looks slightly denser, like this residual graft material, it's, it's not, it's actually, um, we all, there's hundreds of papers to show that beta TCP is fully bioabsorbed. So we know that it's just slightly more dense bone. And the reason for this is when we have grafted sites initially um, prior to the bone turning over in function, we find that there's less connective tissue and therefore the bone becomes slightly more dense radiopaque wise um, rather than there's any residual graft material. These are just, this is just another case of mine. This was done three years ago, now nearly three years. Grade three mobile, she wanted to keep the tooth. So I cleaned the site. I just grafted a small amount. I've cleaned through this, but the bifurcation is easy for her to clean. So I didn't bother to graft that. Just grafted distally and buckly. And it looks like we're losing the graft material here, but at um, three months, you can see it's come back and at two years later, we can see we've got nice, but the main thing is, can you see, we don't have a big pocket distally. Yes, this is that bifurcation, which he's cleaning with TP brushes. And the tooth is completely stable again. And this is three years later. Now, um, you know, it's, it's important uh, that we sometimes try and give what our patients want. And sometimes, yes, they do want to save teeth. And, and this was the case, here showing an HO follower. And um, yes, these two teeth, the patient could move these, uh, uh, it was the lower right, uh, lower right one, lower left one, I think. 
and basically the patient could move them with their tongue. I mean, that's how mobile they were. They were just completely uh, wobbling. And, but she wanted to keep her own teeth. And so we just splintered with temporary, grafted with ethos. Three weeks later, I put the final crowns on. Um, and here it is eight years later. Yes, uh, the, the teeth are now rock solid. And yes, it's not ideal. This is eight years later. The ladies had uh, a, a number of other issues with regards cancer treatment. So it's been a, a, a difficult period. But she still got her own teeth and her own teeth are firm. Whereas most of us would probably have just pulled these out. It's um, especially in the UK, it's really important that the patient gives their input of what they would prefer to to be happening and preserving teeth is becoming a, a more important uh, aspect this is a case i just put up yesterday or the day before like yesterday on ethos case studies um it's not my implant a friend of mine said he just placed this implant 18 months ago and there was a massive suppurating painful site here so we basically opened it up cleaned around the implant and grafted with ethos. Yes, unfortunately it opened. So, you know, when the patient came back uh, eight, 10 weeks later, it had been open for a while. And uh, so it was non optimal, but that was probably because this implant was a little, pla is placed a little too high. But anyway, here it is. And, uh, you know, you know in nine months, 10 months later, and we've had no suppuration and the case seems to be fine. Yes, I polished the top few threads off here anyway, so it's fine. This is the level of bone I was hoping for. And here you can see the actual case using degranulation. Yes, I polished this off completely on the top here. So this is now equivalent to the poly. This was prior to polishing. Yes, there are some other scratches on here. It, it, whether it makes a difference, um, George Kotsakis says it, it will, but um, you know, this is a difficult case. It probably should have been rather removed and regrafted and replaced. But she's happy. Here it is, uh, ten months post, uh, ten months reloaded, and you can see it's not ideal. Yes, we've lost a little bit of height, um, but she's got no suppuration and no pain. So the patient is happy, and, and this is the most important thing: is trying to keep the patient. Um, this is a lady from Lebanon, and, uh, you know, this is a case where we actually had to remove the teeth, you know, as, as we know with Bicom, because there's no micro gap, you never get perimplantitis. No, it's actually a host-driven area, and it's a host response to inflammation from bacteria. And there's bacteria in the mouth all the time. So this was uh, one implant had already fallen out, and we were just about to lose the other, and this fell out as well. Um, I then placed these DO implants and grafted with ethos into the site. Here was, um, I think, 12 weeks later, and you can see we now have really good, nice bony ridge. Unfortunately, she also had, had, uh, had cancer issues and had to go back to Beirut. They were restored in Beirut, and I saw her the other day, about a year ago, and this was four years later, four or five years later, and you can see we've now got a nice stable site um, and, uh, you know, everything's fine. Yes, the restorations could be a, a, a little bit, but it's not affected the case and they actually look clinically look quite good in the mouth. So, you know, sometimes we do have to remove the implants and, and this is something which has been made easier by using um, the Neobiotech, the implant removal kits and but in this particular case where we had a DOUF and it fractured for no reason, probably the lady was a bit of a bruxa. You can see the fracture area here. And we tried the Neobiotech implant remover and it just broke bits of the implant off and I couldn't get it out. So I had to resort to Trefine to get the last remaining bit of the implant out. And then we just grafted with ethos. Here it is clinically showing the Trefining part. There is the remaining portion of the implant and by the time we've to find it out here you can see we've ended up with a reasonable defect and a buckle defect you can see this is where the site was taken out so i'm just grafted with ethos again never over grafting suture closed 
and here it is in 10 weeks. So this is that site. Now we've got a nice new buckle plate and a nice new heel bony site where I find the implant out 10 weeks before. People often sort of say, why 10 weeks? Well, I, this is the healing process and healing time of bone. You know, I said in my first lecture uh, on this series, um, by actually using membranes and using collagen membranes, porcine membranes, you, you're impeding the healing. The miracle of healing is the periosteum. And uh, we see in all our studies that uh, if we use a collagen membrane, we get 50% less new blood vessels in that new bone and that's what healing is all about doesn't matter how we look at it healing is about blood and the host ability to get uh, bmps and to get oxygen to the site to actually encourage this host healing here is just placement now using uh megagen any ridge implants as you can see placed in the ridge the correct height there they are there and that's the end result soft tissue white which wise which is adequate the thing we find where we we get a nice keratinized tissue and not just a, a keratinized but attached keratinized so we find the materials are quite helpful and here it is loaded here uh, um, and everything is stable and adequate um as i said this is more complex cases this is my um my receptionist and she'd had an implant on the other side on the molar and uh, basically she didn't want to have any more block grafts or any more animal products put in there. So we've just done a small tunnel graft. Can you see just by using an instrument, lift the periosteum off, put graft in you using an amalgam carrier, suture it closed. That's all we put in. Can you see this small amount chat? Just a half cc of ethos into the site. I didn't have the actual clinical placement of the implant, but all I did the photographs I lost, I made a small incision, placed a DO implant in with a bit more ethos, put a healing cap on and sutured closed. But here's another 10 weeks later. And as you can see from that thin ridge, we've now got keratinized tissue without needing to do any soft tissue surgery. And we've got a stable implant, which has given us 75 on Ostel, which is more than adequate. Here it is loaded two years. And as you can see, this is this X-ray was at placement, and you can notice there when we're placing just before we're placing the extra ethos, you can see the change, uh, which has occurred now two years later, and you can see how nice and solid the bone looks here without even taking a 3D. So, by just doing a small tunnel graft, we've managed to get a, a small vertical and a horizontal improvement to the site here, and we've got a nice buckle. Uh, keratinized collar on here and if you look at this particular area here you can see how we've got a, a nice filled out and that's because of the new buckle hard tissue underneath and here it is that was it sorry that was it loaded uh, at five years now this was taken two days or three days ago so we can see we've got nice long-term stability and the case is more than adequate uh, as for doing tunnel grafting, here's a, another tunnel on the upper. You can see this is the scan before. Can you see we just got a plate for plate and all the buckle bone is lost. So we've got a narrow plate for plate. So all we're going to do is the same thing. Lift the periosteum off, place the, the ethos using a graft gun. So in other words, you start down here, plus some in, take it out, load the graft gun again with ethos, put some more in, take it out, load it with some more, put it in, and then one suture on the outside. And here it is, sutured closed. Bone is quite new in this case. Sometimes people have very rigid, hard bone, um, uh, and it depends on physiology, and other times you open it up, and it's still kind of new bone formation. This was, as I said, 10 weeks. Um, but this helps us here by expanding this bone uh, and place. So uh, we place slightly wider implants, these are pelvic implants. And then just replace the more ethos over the top, suture closed. You can already see the massive change in the, in the ridge now. So, uh, you know, we've already can see the result we're going. Then we just basically made a small incision, placed healing caps. So you can see now what we have is a nicer, thicker ridge with 
keratinized collars and nice keratinized, attached keratinized tissue. And we're getting very good uh, Ostel penguin readings of C5 ISQ. We just did a cement retained on this and by fitting the abutments with the jig and there it is restored. So we've taken it from here, this narrow thin ridge to before, to having a nice reasonable sized ridge by doing, yes, two processes, but one, the tunnel is actually minimally invasive. And this is a nice new word, which we're using a lot in medicine is minimally invasive. And this is the way we're trying to look more at dentistry. So if we have a look at before, here is that thin ridge before, now you can see the nice ridge and we've got these nice thicker implants in that ridge. Wisdom teeth, yes, Dom showed cases. Uh, Maness just published a paper, I did a bit of work with him on it. Um, and as you can see, the, the real problem is this area. This is where we need to regenerate. Yes, we can just take the wisdom tooth out and it would heal. But in the younger patients, we, we, you know, especially that's not a problem. But as patients get older and the site uh, get, becomes more developed, it may need some help to uh, improve this bone. So just using the standard technique of raising flap, buckle, trough, uh, splitting the roots, uh, you know, there's something we will do all the time, uh, removing. Just be careful when you degranulating the site. We, more this was more degranulation up against the the area over here where there was some granule, quite a bit of granulation tissue up just on the root. Nice clean site. Place the ethos in. Suture closed. And the great thing is what we find is that we're getting no pocket formation distal to the seven, which can be an issue. Here's just the X-rays showing the case being done two weeks post-op six months, nine months, we've got three years, I've got in my other computer at the moment. And the same in another case, you can see the same thing, eight months. And this is the important thing is that we get a good seal and we've got good post regeneration of bone up against the distal aspect of the um, seven. So we don't have that sort of pocketing issue. We'll go a little bit into sinuses and then just cysts and that should be an enough today you know with sinuses it's always important to learn how to do lateral windows but i got caught out by this the other day that is a major vessel and i had a fair bleeder so all i did was rather had to abort doing the sinus and i just grafted this socket site here with some vague cleaning it really turned over well in 10 weeks that i was able to um, place an implant, can you see nice new host bone holding this and cantilever it. <coughs> and I've now placed an implant using a, a Versa lift on, on, on the back teeth, which we won't go into. Right. So Versa and more. That's it. That's real time. From the beginning to end, there was no editing. <clears throat> and as you can see, we are already into the lateral window. In, um, and, and basically, what we can see here is we're going to be lifting, and there is a buckle uh, defect and an oral communication here. So it's important that we take a lot of care when we're actually lifting this particular area. So there you go. Just being really careful, but this is as simple as it is using this DAS system. Since I've used it in 13 years, I think I've torn about this movable. Here's that particular case. There it is before. You can see this is where the oroantral was. And here it is loaded three years. There it is, loaded three years, and we've got a stable result. And when we're looking at how the actual process that I particularly use using a lateral window, can you see this is one I've, I've, lift, I've lifted previously. And then I use the internal desk to just help me make the osteotomy for the placement of the implants. Can you see there it is there. And by grafting initially in this side, it gets the graft material
more ethos to seal the buckle window. It is loading it. This was part of a study which I published in Paris uh, about four or five years ago. Um, and there you can see here we've got nice new host bone in the sinus and that's where the window was and you can see the window has now regenerated here's the uh, uh paris 2000 it's five years ago time flies um this is the uh, prospective study that i did a uh, 10k study uh on um using this protocol so we've been doing it for a long time and it allows us to do cases like this where we can actually Here's the sinus. We're going to actually, we've got a buccal defect. Can you see we're going to repair the buccal defect, grow bone vertically, and repair the bone uh, on the adjacent tooth to um, reduce the stability. So we do it all in one go. It takes 20 minutes to do the whole process. And I loaded it at nine weeks. Here it is loaded nine months. And now you can see the site in the implant's fine. You can see the buccal defect is fine. We've, we've improved the site. And you can see the bone has improved on the distal tooth here, so we've got less mobility. Four years later, yes, there's a lot of other things, decay starting here. But at four years, there was a porcelain fracture, so I just uh, repaired the crown. And as you can see, nice stable keratinized tissue. Did I do any soft tissue surgery? No, it's all done by the host by just repairing the hard tissue underneath. And this allows us to improve this vertical platform as well. And I do this in nearly all my cases, as I showed um, recently on fa uh, Facebook case studies. So you can see this is the sinus. And when I place the implant, I'm not placing the implant all the way in. I'm leaving two, three threads out and I'm grafting over the top. And a year later, you can see nice new host bone in the sinus. Because the material is fully bioabsorbed, all you're seeing is host bone. I mean, sure, we'll get a better x-ray, as I explained in my first lecture, if we just put an, uh, some animal in there uh, that's never going to resorb. But it's important that we only have human bone and host bone so that it turns over and keeps healthy. It's living tissue. We can't replace it with other dead stuff. It must be replaced with living tissue. And you know, we do this routinely, and you can see where we've got this bone loss. For me, anyone, any material will work in the sinus. This is not the important part. This is the important part. This is the part that we need to regenerate well. So as you can see, when we've just lifted the sinus a small amount here, I think using an internal lift, um, this is the important part, this graft tissue here. And as you can see, four years loaded, you can see we've got nice new host bone over the top. And this is what's important for the long-term stability of the implant. And it's important so we keep the papillae, so we actually have a nice looking crown. Um, you know, so it's really, a, really a major, I could do a whole lecture on that, just on how important it is to regenerate the bone vertically and uh, return the host back to where they would have been before. Yeah, you know, a lot of people do put animal parts into, into their human patients. I've never done it. I've only used animal materials on other animals. Um, you know, that's the way I, I sort of feel it, it, it's better. Because yes, if we look at this, it looks fantastic. Look at that lovely sinus lift. But when we look at it on a scan, you know, it, is it important to have these animal parts floating around in the sinus? I'm not so sure, especially when they, they end up in this position. Um, and uh, I prefer to have materials that all fully bioabsorbed. So all we have is human bone. So this situation wouldn't exist. So when we're looking at the more modern uh, techniques using, um, say, Versa or, or, or more fashionable techniques, so it's important to know how to laterally repair. But a lot of uh, the cases now, we can use desk internal or a Versa internal. In this particular case, once these teeth were removed, there was only one millimeter or even just this crystal plate. So I was a little worried about, um, I was gonna place and graft at the same time the patient got nervous, so I socket grafted. So all you can see is I grafted with some ethos into the side. 
And here it is 10 weeks later. Now we've got nice sort of six, seven millimeters, six millimeters of new host bone. And that's really uh, a good thing to have. And the interesting thing is look at the nice new keratinized tissue we have in this site. We raise a flap. Here is that nice new human bone. Can you see there? So we know we've got high quality bone. So I can go with my good friend Ziv and uh, make a choice here. I was going to use the dancer. And you can see there it is driving ethos in using dancer. Now, with, when we're using dancer, make this the driest you can possibly mix it. That tends to help. And then placement of implant a little more just to help get a nice platform for the case. And here it is being restored uh, 10 weeks after that. There it is before at soccer craft and at restoration after 10 weeks. And here it is loaded two years. And again, you can see nice stable, uh, uh, hard and soft tissue environment over a long period of time. And this will help this implant last many years. This is just another one, but now using a, a Megagen implant, doing exactly the same. Can you see we've got very little host bone? Soccer graft, come back in 10 weeks. Now we've got good bone to do uh, an, an internal lift. This is a wife of a dentist, ex-wife. So that's even more important to make sure everything works well. Here is that soccer graft to 10 weeks. You can see the same thing. We've got nice new host bone. And again, just using Versa, Placing the any ridge, there it is, and restored. It's been restored two years now. So it's, uh, you know, we've got an adequate outcome. But it's always important to remember how to be able to do this lateral window technique. It's much easier now with DASC. Um, and as I say, by placing the ethos through the lateral window, as we screwing, I mean, by placing it into the osteotomy, as I'm screwing this any ridge into, into the side, can you see? It's pushing the graft material out the lateral window. I then seal with a dryer mix. Yes, mistake here. You always learn I should have polished this amalgam down. Again, it's not my patience. So I tended not to do it. Uh, I wish I'd done, I'd done that because it probably didn't help. But as you see, we've got two millimeters, two and a half millimeters uh, of residual host bone. Here's at placement and graft. Here's at 12 weeks when we're loading now i've polished it off and here we're just loading at 12 weeks post the sinus augmentation with again with a screw retained uh any ridge implant there it is before um and here it is and you can see even at 12 14 weeks at the when this was taken you can see we've got a nice new cortical plate and we've got nice host bone in here and this is due to the osseoinductive effect of the materials and upregulating the host healing. Uh, and so this is how we can have a look at these cases. Yes, we could look at this even to more of an extreme when I actually have these multiple oroantral communications in this particular case. Here is one here, there's another here, and it was suppurating out of the, the top. So we uh, made the desk. You can see there's connection to the, between the soft tissue and the sinus lining. Here's the other communication. And when we were lifting it up, as I was trying to lift it up, uh, pus was just pouring out uh, of this oriental communication. So I lifted as much as I could. And then we just grafted lateral window oriental communication. And here it is eight weeks later. So now we've got a sealed site. The lateral window is already healed. This is at eight weeks. And this is why it's important not to be using membranes. It allows the periosteum, the induction of stromal cell derived factors to occur and allows for healing. There was a little root left in the palate. So we just took that out at the same time. And we now had 10 millimeters of new host bone um, to place the implant because case is loaded four years now. It also allows us, this is done by Vas and Bagama. I don't see that many full, full arches because maybe the area we work in, but you can see this is 2016, nice thin ridge, 2019. You can see the improvement and you can see that clinically as well. You can see where these implants are placed. You can see a lack of keratinized tissue. That's the ethos there underneath. 
And here it is three years later, you see nice, healthy, correct, nice, nice, healthy, thick ridge. And again, you can see he does it in, in, in the same procedure in a number of cases, this is an all on four. And you can see by starting off with thin ridge, by just placing Ethos Buckley, you can see uh, two years later, he's now got a nice buckle ridge and nice correct, nice tissue. And looking at it in cross section, this is before and afterwards, this is the important aspect is to have this new buckle bone. Right, cysts, and then uh, that's nearly about it. This is a big ridiculous cyst. You can see that's the histology. Here's it being removed. This was a friend of mine. So again, uh, it was quite dramatic. And as you can see, this tooth was completely mobile, grade three mobile. I really thought we may have to remove this as well, but we decided we're gonna try and keep it. And you can see we've just got a nice clean site in there where the cyst was grafted with ethos and sutured it closed. Yeah, maybe we could have grafted a little more. Oddly enough, we had some small soft tissue in here, which we just cleaned out later. But you can see generally from that big defect, we've got, got a nice new host bone. And I then just, as you can see, cleaned this site out and we've created an osteotomy. I've used the two PDS suture technique, which I described in the last lecture. All you do is you cut a little short section of two PDS suture off and you make two holes, tuck it in one end, tuck it in the other end. And when we look at the x-rays, you can see the reason for that big cyst was the ridiculous cyst from this tooth. And here it is grafted with ethos, one month post-op and uh, three months post-op. Here we can see a placement. I've placed another um, any ridge implant into that osteotomy. And we're using this suture just to help support the soft tissue to allow for the further bone, buckle bone to grow. Can you see? Because we haven't got, we just want to try and get a thicker buckle plate here. So there it is being grafted and placed. There it is in, in the mouth. And here it is scanned two years later. And you can see this is where the cyst was. You can see nice new bony infill. And the interesting thing is this nice buckle plate that has now been regenerated uh, around that implant. And this has given us nice tissues and nice stability. The tooth in front is now obviously very stable. Initially, I thought we may have to root canal it, uh, do root treatment on it, but everything is fine and everything is stable. So we're very happy. Doing a, a, a big assist here, this required actually seven cc's, so you can see the removal of, of the cyst, clean the site well, and uh, put seven cc's of ethos in, so this was a massive case. There it is, suture closed again with Ficrol. Again, histology to make sure that there's nothing untoward. And here it is 18 months later, and you can see it's all regenerated and the site looks healthy we're looking at the sections are taking at the same position at, at the t4 and we can see a nice new buckle plate has reformed and the site is stable uh, this is done three years ago now um and and so at the moment we're looking at even at doing things in a further concept and 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 how we can improve by using uh ethos to improve this keratinized tissue at the really difficult point for zygomas and nasalis implants. And uh, we're just about to start a study on, on that at the moment. Um, so we, you know, we're living and learning a whole lot uh, and the importance of actually grafting this particular area. This is where if any failure is gonna occur, as in this case, it's gonna occur in here. The reason it occurs is by not having hard and therefore keratinized tissue, um, this is the area that's prone to bacterial issues. And with zygomatic, zygomatic implants, this can be a major issue. So by grafting these particular areas with ethos, we then can end up with a nice thick keratinized tissue, thanks to Riz, these nice pictures as well, Riz Said. Um, so this has been taken in a lot more extreme cases. She has using ethos with hip grafts at, at St. George's and uh, at the head neck deformity units. And uh, they found that they're using ethos with uh, allergenic and autogenous corticocancellus, so just by itself. And we've been getting 
great results. So yes, we can go, um, you know, it's a question of developing your skills in, in a regenerative approach. So we can go as far as, I'd like to give special thanks to all, all the dentists whose work I've, I've shown again here and uh, and allowed me to show their skilled work uh, for the discussion of the benefits of what we're really doing in true bone regeneration. So I would like to uh, thank you all. Oops, sorry, got the wrong ending on here, but I'd like to thank you all in the, in the, in the Middle East for um, attending. And the most important thing is, um, that's my email address to visit us at ethos.dental, to come and see the past uh, webinars, past case discussions, and to join us at uh, Facebook uh, case studies. Um, so thank you very much for all your time. And um, we'll just take some questions now before we uh, end off this morning. Yeah, thank you for that, Peter. That was very interesting. Um, we've just got a question through from Ellie Ward. Uh, can you explain about the PDS tensing sutures? Yeah, I tell you what the best thing Ellie, is to actually look. I, I'm actually doing, um, if you see case studies, you'll notice that I'm probably doing one to two cases a week now using this tenting. This tenting techni uh, technique, we've been doing for about six or seven years and Mike Ainsworth introduced it. Um, we find that um, the results have been exceeding my expectations to the, the point that now I'm looking back and, and I'm just going to show on Ethos case studies a, a, a three-year follow-up uh, scan. And um, it's, it's turning out to be far more valuable and far easier and more cost-effective than using tenting screws. And I think you get better stability even then because there's it's a more spread pressure over the, over the, the soft tissue. Um, and so... We'd, we'd started to do this a lot, lot more now, and I think the results will be seen in, in later. And then for me, it's become a, a, a routine protocol that I'm doing literally all, all the time. So the best way to actually do is to visit ethos.dental, look up Mike Ainsworth, where he then has a whole webinar just about this tenting. But the way of actually doing it is by just using a green stable of drill we basically make two holes or four holes if you want to do two tents and then we cut a short section of uh, the 2.0 pds from ethicon and we just bend put in one hole and then using your tweezers bend it over and put it in the other hole so that's all it is and because the suture material wants to naturally straighten itself it actually is pushing against those two holes and it gives it unbelievable stability i just did uh, and i put it on case studies um uh the beginning of this week i think i did the smallest one uh, the shortest one i've ever done which took me even took me about 15 minutes to get it done but once you develop the technique to do it and and understand it it's actually a, a very very good uh way of actually dealing with this yeah brilliant thank you um, we've just got another question. Um, if anyone does have any questions, there's a Q&A box just to ask your questions live, or you can ask Peter with, a, with his email afterwards. Uh, we've got a question from Awa. Uh, do you mix uh, mix ethos with blood or saline and, and why? No, you, you, you don't. Just mix it with saline. The blood can impede the set because the protein in the blood can impede the setting nature of the calcium sulfate. So it's better to just put it into the side. Look, because you haven't got a membrane, the moment you actually suture over, you've, you're introducing blood. Um, and, and because there's no membrane to stop the blood, you're going to get neovascular ingrowth in a, very, in, in a very short period of time. And as the calcium sulfate element bioabsorbs at two to three, four weeks, we then find that we're getting further neovascular ingrowth into the site. And I suspect this, this is what we feel is the reason why uh, the materials perform uh, uh, much better than just standard beta TCP by itself. So yes, it is about blood, but you don't need to, don't mix it with blood purposely, always just use saline and we go from there. Um, just another question about the, the PDS sutures um, from Catalina. She's just asking, when do you, do you remove the, 
the sutures? You don't have to remove the sutures, they biabsorb themselves. And, and, and this is a, another really good, strong point about it. We can, we've, you know, this is a tenting mechanism where you don't need to go back and do a secondary surgery. I'm now actually using this tenting technis, a technique with a uh, cervico. So I'm making a customized healing abutment and the te tenting technique, and we, we're just getting amazing results. We're getting molars that we have the most incredible emergence profile in 10 weeks from nothing before. And again, if you if you visit Ethos case studies, you'll you'll see these being done. And um, and you know, I'll post up. I'm just finishing off another one at the moment, and I'll post that up as well. So the tenting technique has been a bit of a a revelation. It was first published about ten years ago, um, but the materials that we were using weren't um, suitable or, or not ideal. We now feel we've we've come a long way with tenting. So, uh, it, as, as I say, I would sort of say it's something I'm doing more and more of, and and the results have been really good. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, what what instrument? I've just got one from Mia Mia Tal. What instrument is used to put the ethos um, in the closed sinus lift? I actually um, take the ethos out, put it in a, a dappen dish. And then you use a, an amalgam carrier, amalgam gun to put it in, which is a three point. Yes, it would be nice to make a syringe to that size, um, but then it would be difficult. Then it's difficult. We've got a new syringe coming, but then it makes it difficult uh, to actually um, mix the material if we've got a very narrow syringe. So it's important that you know, you know, it's, we can actually mix it correctly. And we've got a new syringe with it, which, which has got a slight bend on it, but it all takes time with the new EU regs to, uh, and medical devices has put us back about two years in the, in the development of this. So what I used is, um, is I placed the ethos in using a, an amalgam carrier. Um, there's lots on the market that you can get. Um, yes, thank you, Catalina, um, and, and thanks, Mia. Uh, um, it's, uh, it's, it's great to be talking to everyone again today. Um, and are there any other questions, Joe? I think that's it for now. Um, so all right. You, thanks. Thank you, we've all got to get to work again, <laughs> but, um, as I say, visit us on ethos case studies and that you'll see really what we're actually doing right now. Thank you very much. All right. Bye. Bye-bye then. Great day.